All right. Hey, y'all. Mr. Gibson here with your next lesson in cryptography. And today we're going to be looking at one method that we could use to determine the keyword length for the Visionaire cipher. We'll go on to learn how knowing the length of the keyword is going to be really helpful for us. But for today, we're going to focus in on just how to find the length of that keyword. And the method that we're going to be using is called the Kasiski test. The Kasiski test was named after this person here, Friedrich Wilhelm Kasiski, um, a German um, military person um, who wrote in 1863 a 95-page book on cryptography. Um, and it was the first published account of a procedure for attacking the Visionaire cipher, but more broadly, polyalphabetic substitution ciphers of other types as well. It's worth noting that Charles Babbage was most likely already aware of this method about 10 to 15 years earlier, but just hadn't published it, maybe just kept it to himself. Charles Babbage um, is widely known as kind of the, the father of computing and the, creating some of the first mechanical computers ever, ever made. Uh, this method that we're going to discuss relies on analyzing the gaps between repeated fragments in ciphertext. Um, and those gaps are what's going to give us the hints about the length of the keyword. Now, you might be thinking, like, there shouldn't be any repetitions in our ciphertext. That's one of the main reasons we switched over to polyalphabetic ciphers, because unlike monoalphabetic substitution ciphers, the same letters in your plain text don't go to the same letters in your ciphertext. That's the whole point. So how do we get repetitions? So let, let's start by looking at some repetitions and think about, well, why are they even there? So here's an example ciphertext. This was enciphered using the Visionaire cipher. And if you stare at this for a little bit, you might see some repeated fragments. I'll highlight them here now. There we are. Um, there's more than just these two, but we're going to focus in on the repeated fragments ZVRAO and MBDBMVS. So a five-letter fragment that repeats, and then a seven-letter fragment that repeats. And we're going to think about, well, why are these here? Is this just random? Um, it's supposedly you know, plausible that this, these could just show up by chance. But the fact that we've got so many repetitions of this length seems like it could not just be random. There's got to be some underlying pattern here at play. So let's take a look at maybe how these repetitions in our visionary ciphertext are generated. To do that, we're going to use this plain text phrase. Uh, this is a little fragment here of a sentence, one sentence that ends on a plane, and then the next fragment starts with the plane is due. Um, and we're going to try and encrypt this using Visionaire with a couple of different keywords here. We're going to see, do any of these keywords cause a repetition to occur in the ciphertext for the same fragment in the plain text? So let's start with the five-letter keyword, water. And when we encrypt our plain text into ciphertext, we'll see that the plain text repetitions start eight characters apart. So the first letter P to the next letter P is eight characters. Um, but we don't get a repetition in the ciphertext. The first time is TCWNX, and the second time is PEEEA. So no repetition for this one. Let's try a different keyword. Let's choose a shorter one, a four letter keyword, just chose milk. Um, and when we encrypt our same phrase using that four letter keyword, we do get a repetition. So we have eight letters or eight characters between our plain text repetition and we get a ciphertext repetition. They both go to Z, X, I, Y, O. We can kind of see, well, it makes sense. The running key seems to have the same five characters above the word plain in both circumstances. Let's try one more time. Let's use an eight letter keyword. We'll choose the word hospital. And when we create our running key and we encrypt our plain text, Yet again, we get a repetition in the ciphertext because, again, in the running key, the same five letters appear over the word plain both times. So let's think about that for a minute. Why are we getting sometimes our running key lining up over the same words in the plain text? What might cause that to happen? So you could sit here and we could do some trial and error and try a bunch of different key lengths and figure out which ones cause the repetition. But for the sake of time, I've got some information to share. So let's look. When we had our characters that repeated in the plain text eight characters apart, it turns out that keywords of length two, four, and eight would cause that repetition in the ciphertext. If our repeated plain text fragments were a little bit further apart, maybe 10 characters, uh, the keywords of length two, five, and 10 would also cause 
repeat uh, repetitions in the ciphertext. And if we had a plain text that repeated 20 characters apart, the keywords that would cause repetition would be 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. So you need to hit pause on the video here and think about what's the pattern here? What's causing the repetition based on the length of the keyword when you know how far apart your plain text fragments are? It turns out the result is that if you have your keyword of a given length, we'll call that n, if that n divides into the distance between the repeated plain text fragments, which we'll call delta, then the corresponding ciphertext is going to repeat as well. So a couple ways we could think about that. If you want the math way, we could say that delta, the distance between the plain text fragments, is congruent to zero when we're working in the modulus of n. If you're more program or Python uh, minded, we could say that if the delta mod by n is equal to zero, then that means you're going to get the repetition in the ciphertext. So let's see how this plays out here. Let's go back to our example. Let's see how we can use this fact to our advantage here. We're going to look at first at the fragment ZVRAO. And we're going to look at the index in our string, or basically the position in the, in the, in the ciphertext, that the repetitions start at. So the first one's at index 102, and then 134, and then 390, 402, and 426. With the green ones here, the M, B, D, B, M, V, S, they're at 143, 155, 307, 411, and 439. And I find it usually pretty helpful to put this in a table. So we've got our repeated fragments, the indices of each occurrence of the, of the fragment, and then I calculated those delta values. So just looking at, like, to say, Z, V, R, A, O, um, the first occurrence is at 102, the next one was at 134, so the first delta value is 32. There were 32 characters apart. And then between 134 and 390, it was 256 apart and then 12 and 24 respectively. And then for the second fragment, the MBDB, MVS, those delta values you get are 12, 152, 104, and 28. Now, notice we can get a lot of different delta values, but there's only one value for n. n is the actual value of our keyword. And remember what we just said. If we assume that those repeated fragments in the ciphertext are coming from not chance, but repeated fragments in the plain text, then whatever the length of the keyword, n, it has to divide all of these deltas, not just one or two, but all of them. So there's a couple strategies that we could, we could use here. We can just kind of guess and check, and you might kind of realize, we'll start with the small numbers. If it's got to divide 12, let's start there. So it's either got to be 2 or 3 or 4 or 6 or 12. And then you can kind of start cross-referencing those against the larger ones. Well, okay, it can't be 12 because 12 doesn't divide into 32, for example. Or uh, it can't be 6 because 6 doesn't divide into 28. And you can start whittling down your possibilities from there. And once you do that, you realize, well, it's got to be either 2 or 4. And a lot of times when we can narrow it down to two or three choices, uh, we can just assume that whoever the person encrypting the message is, uh, they use the most secure option. So if I had this two or four, uh, I would guess four. A two-letter visionary keyword isn't, isn't very secure. Another way you could do it that's a little more systematic as opposed to kind of guessing and checking is we can use the prime factorizations of our delta. So um, you might remember learning in school that every number can be factored down to um, its primes. So for example, 12 can be factored down to 2 times 2 times 3 or 2 squared times 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of work our way from smallest to biggest of our delta values and comparing its prime factorizations uh, to figure out which factors are in common between all of these numbers. Because if n it has to divide all seven of these numbers, that means n should have the same, or at least share some factors with all of these numbers. That's what it means to divide. It means that it shares the factors of the number it's dividing into, or at least some of the factors. So um, we'll go to the next row here, and we'll see that 24 factors to 2 cubed times 3. And if we look at, well, which factors does it share with our set of common factors so far, it still only shares 2 squared times 3. And then we'll prime factorize 28, and we get 2 squared times 7. And we'll look, OK, well, which of those factors does it have in common with our, our list so far? So if we compare that to 2 squared times 3, the only factors in common are 2 squared. And then we'll prime factor uh, 32, 
that's 2 to the 5th. The only factors in common between 2 to the 5th and 2 squared are 2 squared. And we can keep moving down the line, and ultimately we realize that the only factors that are in common between all seven of those numbers uh, are 2, 2 squared, which means that the only possible numbers uh, that our key length could be is either 2 squared itself or some subset of those factors, so either 2 or 2 squared. So we get the same result. We know that our key could either be 2 or 4 in length, and again, we'll assume 4. Now the question becomes, now that we know, or at least feel pretty confident, that our keyword has length 4, how do we know what the keyword is and what's the resulting plain text? But we're going to save that for a future lesson. For now, that's it for the Kasiski test. Make sure you practice this a few times using our checkpoint quiz and make sure you got a hang of it. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.